Hello, Daniel. Hello, Adam. Good to see you. It's good to see you. How are you? Oh, not too bad. Um, uh, summer is coming. Um, so weather is warmer. It's uh, raining a bit, but it's nice. Um, uh, it, it, it is a, it is a, um, a nice uh, week so far. Can't complain. Too much to do, but, you know, that's, that's a good sign. And um, yeah, they they crowned crowned the monarch uh, in a way and that gets gets things going. Yeah, having having a monarch is is something that uh, some countries have. I mean, everybody remembers the British, but actually, there are quite a few European countries that still have a monarch. Um, it's just not being talked about so much. Um, and uh, I think something is something is what's lost and moving away from monarchical solutions. I don't know. I mean, people people don't like monarchy because they feel um, it's privileging uh, certain certain people. They say they have a privilege, and uh, that's certainly true. But I personally, when I look at the monarch, to be honest, I don't see a poor guy sitting there and having to you know uh, keeps calm and sil still and silent for for hours uh, when the the um, occasion demands i see a symbol of the country so the whole point of a monarch today uh it's not an executive uh, that makes a decision the monarch doesn't make decisions the monarch represents and as in in so far the monarch is a bit like a flag out of flesh and blood, if you like. And uh, that's what it is. And people have this uh, problem with that because they say, oh, they have so much money and can do all these things. That's true, but to be honest, I wonder how many people would actually want to exchange seats with that guy who cannot decide what they want to do, cannot choose, possibly to some extent, they are limited in who, who they can marry or can, can go out with. Uh, they are limited in how much free time they actually have. Uh, they have a job that is basically 24 seven being observed by everybody in the world. Um, not a nice job. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a very demanding job. I, I do think that the money is there. That's true. But, you know, um, it's not like, it's it's not like I, I do think a modern CEO that that or modern modern startup founder that makes a couple of billions and then um, exits the company and takes the money with him has far more power and far more can afford far more privilege because they can just disappear and do their own stuff buy an island somewhere and and, and just have fun. Um, so I do think that uh, monarchy in in some way today is simply a way of having a representative of the state that doesn't change and that kind of has to adhere to certain rules. Because in the end of the day, uh, presidents that are elected also are something like, a, something like a flag. In very, very, very rare cases, do they have a political role? Look at Italy. Sometimes Italy, the president can, can make political pushes like try to find a solution or kind of referee type. Uh, but it is not actually a good situation if that is not necessary. In a healthy uh, democracy, that is actually a little bit like an emergency button. You don't want that. To what extent are monarchs good models for some types of selfhood? and some types of control processes like that we might need for regulation of ourselves across like is, is what are the how far can we go with that metaphor model i think today today that has gone i don't think that's that there's much left right if you go to louis Catorce, the louis louis um, who is the 14th of france it's a completely different story uh he would say okay uh l'état c'est moi i am the state and he would basically decide um, what, what happens in the state and what harms him harms the state and what helps him helps the state. Um, I think he was probably also the longest lived, 
longest ruling monarch ever um, or amongst them. Um, now, he made mistakes and quite bad ones actually um, that harmed France on the long run. Um, so it's not always a good thing, right? The, the, but, but people do derive their understanding of what France is and how it operates partly by him. There's a reason why Versailles, to some extent, is, is identified with the French monarchy and why the Republicans actually um, did not, in France, did not like that. They basically said, let's get rid of this. of this, And then they basically installed, when we look at the French president today, very much it looks like an elected monarch. Many things of what the, how the president operates look like, a, it's like a monarchy except limited in time. And um, that is actually quite interesting, actually much more so than in the US, for example. I don't think that um, the, the president has that amount of dominance over the, over the political process as in France. But I'm, I'm not an expert in the French system, I must say. It's just an uh, impression as an uninformed, interested outsider. What so we can, sorry. Um, I, I, I'll let you ask a question in a second. Well, I just came uh, one idea. What we can say is that the concept of the state is an interesting one. When you talk about selfhood, that is the actual interesting concept. It's less the monarch or the particular state form. Is what what is the state? But anyway, I, well, over you, to you. you're saying like monarchs. So I, I was thinking initially just monarchs versus not monarchs, but now you're also bringing up like styles of kingship and and relation. Like there's the reign, the the, the space of monarchs, and so I guess. Um, the roles of selfhood as uh, different kinds of selfhood as a governing process as a um, means of creating stability and consistency across circumstance and time like the kinds of like I, so like there, there's there's some like more like uh, you know the society of mind can be more anarchic um, and you don't, you know, no need for a king, no need for anything, uh, no need for homunculi's or inner kings, just um, process, just intelligence and skillful governance by, by a well-tuned system. But I guess what I'm wondering is like, is there a place for monarch-like emergent data structures as controllers for people selves? Like what, like, like kinds of monarchs, kinds of selves that you might want or not um, in different circumstances? That's a, that's a difficult question because there are different actors at play. So if we, if we follow Harari in his first book, um, he makes an interesting point about the emergence of society. Um, so from hunter-gatherer to agricultural society, um, it was not a happy time for most people actually. Um, hunter gatherers have a relatively again i'm citing him i have to I'm, I'm going with what he the point he makes have actually quite nice life in the sense that yes it's a little bit more precarious but it's much more interesting hunting today this animal tomorrow another animal collecting berries and fruits at different locations going around doing different stuff learning about different plants learning about different animals if you have an agricultural society, you keep doing the same thing every day over and over and over and over. There's no variety. The food is not varied. Um, you probably have vitamin deficits uh, in early agricultural societies. Then what's even worse, you now get a split of the, of the society. You get the division of labor, which for the society may be good, for the individuals, not so much. Uh, because then you have, of course, individuals that are warriors who naturally, the word gravitate is not quite right. They, they move upwards because warriors, by their very nature, are more powerful and have more power than the farmers. So you get now a warrior caste. And almost in every, in almost every society, the warrior caste is pretty far up. It's not at the very top necessarily, but it's, it's usually is close to the to the halls of power and then you end up with um the layers of administration and and kingship chiefs chiefdom priesthoods that decide how the society moves around and now the question is who 
do they actually serve? And the argument is that when a society starts, usually it starts out with a kleptocracy. So the people at the top, they just take what they can get. We find that in many countries that have get centralized power, too much centralized power too quickly. And we find that usually they get dictators, modern terms of dictators, people who basically have unlimited control and take what they want as individuals, not in the interest of the, of the society itself. We're not talking about the um, enlightened monarch here. We're talking about much, much earlier than that. The enlightened monarch is actually an interesting concept because it's thinking is, of like um, roving versus stationary bandits models of like the formation of statehood where it's like it's easier to extract resources from a people if they stay put and then you kind of like it was almost like the a, a co-domestic domestication of the, the bandits and the people they were thieving from and, and like, i've heard these as some models like for like um interesting interesting idea i i don't think that's that's necessarily the case, right? You you find that the, the stable monarchies, uh, many, not all of them, but many of them, simply they had to keep the people happy. I mean, um, it is actually um, interesting to see if you look at one of the longest ruling monarchs in history, Hero, Hero II of Syracuse. He ruled for 50 years. That was at the time of the Second Punic, Punic War, if I remember correctly. 50 years is a long time for those times. It's, it's really, really long rule. And he was very much liked by his people. He had so much grain that he could give to Rome and help them during the war. So clearly he could afford to do that. Um, once he was, once he passed away, his, his, his sons thought they knew better and they started messing about. Uh, and, and the whole thing went down the drain. Basically, it basically ended ended uh, Syracuse as a separate entity at the end of this process. Um, the problem with a single person monarchy is you have a single point of failure. The monarch is clever and smart and you know knows how to people like him. Um, maybe makes good decisions and keeps making good decisions. Um, we see that Rome, late Rome monarchic Rome essentially had a problem with that you basically it was hit and miss some some monarchs knew knew how to handle it uh, most did not and uh, the the reason Rome survived is because it's it's overall system had a lot of inertia which saved Rome again and again and again and occasionally you had a revival like Ariel Aurelianus who got the empire back on track again. Uh, some people think that Major Janus, had he not been murdered by Rissima, he might have done the same thing again in the fifth century and maybe Rome would have survived for another 100 or 200 years. We don't know, hard to say. So um, when you are in a balance of powers, so, so uh, I, I, ideally like the myth is true of an enlightened monarch and ideally one of them is enlightened as possible, but if there's a single point of failure, they have to be enlightened. But alternatively, like you were talking about like the Venetian model of this sort of like checking processes. And so like, did this like put pressure on monarchs to become more enlightened or, um, or just make up for the fact that... Um... I, it's a very good question, actually. I, I mean, there are many theories and it, because it's all kind of counterfactual, um, we, we don't really know. Um, but we can learn from history and try to infer the counterfactuals. So, of course, the big crisis of the Middle Ages is, um, amongst other, the Black Death, which basically re removed something like 30 to 50 percent of the European population. Um, it was just, they just died, and suddenly farmers were more valuable. Um, trading became more important because now you, you had limited resources, so you had to distribute them in more in better ways. So the distribution mechanism was worth paying for. That's what trade is, right? If you have everything locally, you don't need trade so much. Um, then um, the rise, of course, of the um, merchant class in, in the Netherlands, um, in Italy, of course, uh, then you had basically all these 
views that a single monarch cannot control everything anymore. So, so it's basically the market started taking over. Second problem is, of course, that the Black Death put so many questions to religion that religion became this thing that had to reform. And one way of reforming was, of course, Protestantism. Um, but the other way to reform was becoming scientists and becoming uh, asking questions in a more systematic way, in a way that is not controlled by a decree from, from the top. Um, by the way, Protestantism in a way has that in common with science, in the sense that the decrees are not central, they, they are more delocalized. With all this, if you want to create a centralized state, you had the other pressure, which was exactly the opposite. Of course, you had this these huge set of marauding bands and, and the sack of Rome and <clears throat> 30 years war and this, this unbelievable instability in Europe where basically everybody was killing everybody. Basically, um, failed states were everywhere, so especially in Central Europe. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire at some point ended up being a failed state. It was not a state really, but it, it be, behaved like a failed state to some extent. And now consolidation became the matter. And consolidation means you have to say, okay, who's, who's consolidating? Who makes a decision and what belongs together? Of course, it started with monarchs, but it was not enough to be a monarch. You had to be enlightened. And then the much maligned Machiavelli if you read Machiavelli, I mean, you read it, not just read the tidbit or something, you read the book, you read what he said, he's actually a precursor of the enlightened monarchy. He has already, he's talking about that already. In fact, I believe actually Machiavelli is a precursor of, of nationalism. So in other words, he says, a city is much better defended by its own citizens than by foreigners. Now that is precursor for nationalism. It says people who have ownership feel that they have ownership of what, whatever they're defending, they're much more likely to do a good job at that than some mercenary, you pay them money and if somebody else pays more money, then they will go to somebody else. That's the problem that plagued the uh, 1500s Italy all the time. Yeah, yeah. If you had a Swiss, <laughs> Swiss mercenaries who were very excellent, the problem, they were like Greek mercenaries in, the, <laughs> in, uh, in uh, 300, 400 BC. Basically, they, if you paid them more, they would switch sides. Sometimes they would just switch sides to not fight their fellow Swiss, uh, Swiss friends. <laughs> so in other words, you end up with a situation where you need to find the binding principle between whoever the actors are in your concerted action. And in my opinion, that was also the driver to monarch, to the enlightened monarchy. And interestingly, actually, it was to some extent an enlightened monarch, two enlightened monarchs, which were quite big troublemakers. We don't like to think about that. But the first one was Frederick the Great, and the other one was Napoleon. I would call Napoleon definitely a, an enlightened monarch. I mean, he came after the revolution, but that doesn't main, make a difference. I mean, he had every... He had a lot of in common with the, the series of enlightened monarchs beforehand. So it's almost like, <clears throat> it seems like a very extreme example of a conservation of misery and that you might want someone to be able to, under some circumstances to be able to be this focal point for coordinated action to help with the um, the, the, the coherent, uh, stable modes of action selection carried out under over a, a, enough extent with enough of an intent that others can co like coordinate with you, and that you can like let's, what what you might need for something complex like uh, uh, surviving a war or something like this. Um, but then, and and and, and even in countries without monarchs, they'll sometimes give the president like monarch-like powers temporarily, these like dictatorial type powers in times of emergency. Classically a uh, Roman Republic, right? Yeah. The word dictator comes from there. It's an excellent example. And by the way, an example for how it actually goes when you don't have a monarch. Um, 
is the war against Hannibal. When the Roman Republic had a war against Hannibal, they had um, two consuls. Uh, I think one was called Publi um, Paulus, the other was Varro, if, if, if I remember correctly. It, what, the point was that because they couldn't agree on the strategy against Hannibal, they would take turns um, um, basically uh, commanding the army. <laughs> Which is, you know, when you're on a, on a war path against a very, very, very capable opponent, having basically two brains controlling the embodiment of your army um, alternatingly, that's not a good, that's quite a drastic handicap. And uh, Hannibal used that to his uh, advantage in Kane and basically destroyed an army of 80,000 or something like that. Romans. It's cut right through. I forget what it was. Well, earlier conversation, something about what happens when people consolidate their will in rare ways. They tend to, um, that, that's a potentially promising but very dangerous thing. Like that sort of consolidation of intention and force. Like someone can really create change in the world if you have that sort of like unified functioning, for better and worse. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the sources of nationalism. The whole point of nationalism is actually quite interesting, in my opinion. Um, it, it was much more aligned. There's a there's a whole um, set of history storyline that aligns it. But I personally like it. Uh, like to look at it from a systemic point of view, from a structural point of view. So, in a way, um, the enlightened monarch um, was superseded by. Um, by nationalism. So you say, we don't want this one person that makes all the decisions, right? Maybe we need them temporarily, but they, there should not be so much power concentrated there. And in a way, um, the French Revolution paved the way for that. Possibly also the American Revolution. I, I will not take that away, but I think the French Revolution was, was more influential in making that very explicit. It's a, the nation, it's not the individual anymore. It's, it's a nation that is now important. Um, of course, this is not a new idea. I mean, the, the Rome Rome was had the similar ideology. Rome as the, the concept of 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 uh, the Republic of Rome, of Rome itself, the city um, that ru rules the world. So there's something that you say. This is what I'm working for. When that erodes, of course, you get instabilities, and then people start to fragment into groups and to fragment into interest groups that don't have this binding anymore. And then the priority, you basically get the dissipation of identities. And then countries or states or institutions or they can disintegrate. And that does happen. So there's this idea of like a, a general factor of psychopathology that seems to correspond to like a, a lack of stability um, within the personality structure. Um, like it, it tends to correspond to actually low conscientiousness, uh, low agreeableness and high neuroticism. And if you look at like the hierarchical structure of the big five, that would be like the inverse of this meta trait called stability. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess it's sort of like, I, I'm wondering whether like the, the, the well-tuned uh, soul, if you will, or, or agent um, has a kind of like flexible internal political structure where you can have more monarch-like and non-monarch-like processes and, and, and the good self processes know when to like have more control and know when to withdraw and just let things play and flow freely and let things slide around a bit more and be more exploratory. But the, but when it, um, but, but, but it can go, but, but if you have like this, this lever that can take control of the whole system, uh, when it gets it right, wonderful. But then if it gets it wrong and like the complexities of life or it has, it goes on one path too far, it could be a disaster. And, but then you might say, okay, but you might also say like, um, uh, so you'll see this in some like, um, within like the psychedelic literature and then the, and the contemplative science literature um, studies, they, 
sometimes it's like the, the, the optimal state of functioning for beings like us is to remove self processes, to be more anarchic, to, to get rid of the, the monarchs or conductors and to be, and to go for more of like a self-organizing harmony with your surroundings. But what I'm wondering is, is if you remove, well, while, while you don't want like a permanent dictator, I don't think within, within you, within you to re completely remove it. I wonder if you get something like warring factions, if you get just sort of like, is it like within there, like not warring factions, but a lack of coherence to organize your life to help you get through the world with enough stability. And then um, as a result of this lack of effectiveness, things potentially can cascade and fall apart or just you uh, don't become actualized in your life. Like it just sort of, you muddle along. And so I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to think of like how, how far should I push political analogies to think of internal governance? Is it, how it, dangerous it's, is that? <laughs> you don't have to go so far. Right, there's a much more accessible model um, of governance, um, and that's a conductor of a classical orchestra, um, which is really the optimal level of of looking between the individuals and the, the gov government, because you can have good orchestras can play quite well without a conductor for a while. So what's the role of conductor? Basically the job of the conductor when he's conducting the piece in front of people with a good orchestra, in a way it's done. He just, he just basically does a choreography. His job is to get people to develop this coherent sound, coherent piece, coherent vision of what they're going to play in front of the audience. Of course, there are very complicated pieces where conductors needed and to, to synchronize them and to correct mistakes and to, 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 to buffer off issues. But the point is you can get very far without the conductor. Okay, we have to be fair. We have to be fair, of course. And if you have a classical piece, there's a score. Everybody shares the score. So there is already an element of synchrony imposed on uh, the system. In in um, in I'm not such a, such an expert, but in jazz and, and jazz combos, uh, it's a rhythm that keeps them together, right? So they have this way of of playing together, and they have have the 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 standards that they know. And the question is, in governance, the situation is a bit different because you muddle through most of the time, but then there are emergencies or real dangers or real deficits that have to be planned long ahead. This is not fun. If I am a leader of a country and I, I know that there will be a drought uh, next year, I have to take people's grain away, store it to make sure that people will have this grain next year. Of course, nobody wants to give out the grain. They don't want it, right? They want to keep it for themselves. As a governor, you basically have to work uphill to do this. And now the problem is, this is the first thing you have to work against. And the second thing you have to work against is not to give in to your uh, nobleman, <laughs> to nobility, to give them the grain that you just, I will not call it stole. You, you basically, you um, raised, you, you cashed in from your farmers. Uh, nobility say, oh, you have all this grain, give us some because we want to build now this new, this new uh, palace. And you have to say, say no to them. So you have to have taken the grain from the farmers, that's the easy part, because the farmers can't fight back usually, right? And they don't usually do that. But saying no to the nobility, that's quite a different thing. You have to be quite, I would say, quite forceful. Is to to say no, no, you're not going going to get that. That's not for you, right? So, in other words, um, this central unit is, if it works well, needs to be able to do, say, delayed rewards. Um, needs to work against resistance. Needs to make correct guesses too. Because let's assume 
you take all this stuff away from your farmers and you think it's the right thing to do. And then it turns out they all starve because they actually needed it. I mean, we know that uh, in communist states, uh, some five-year plans were done without any regard to whether the people actually um, would profit from that or would survive this. Decisions may, are made and people basically just starve because the decision is just plain wrong. It's not a good decision. In other words, the, the problem that you're facing when you are such a centralized entity, everything is decided by you and you have to get everything right. Make a mistake and people are in trouble. So in other words, one reason why you want actually pluralist society is not so much because um, it's so nice or anything, but because knowledge usually is not concentrated in one person. And experience is not concentrated in one person, uh, but it's distributed. So would there be some connections um, so that this way it seems like a source of, of, of disanalogy between governance of um, peoples versus persons? Because like in persons, uh, the credit assignment, while still thorny, is a lot more tractable. It's like tightened up by like, you have a particular location where you're pursuing particular actions and certain things of the frame of uh, uh, certain aspects of like what should I do and what just happened are curtailed just by the fact that you knew where you were and what you were pursuing and so but if you're dealing with I, I, I guess I'm thinking of um, like Hayek's like uh, central planning uh, um, it's almost like a credit assignment problem of like uh, what was it the central planning calculation problem but it's like all these people they're different like desires um, to actually track all these contingencies, like no one person can do this. But if all you're accounting for is your own desires, you might have a chance. <laughs> you, so. you, you have a very simple chance, and I'll tell you what, what, why you have this chance. Say, first of all, from a symptomatic point of view, if you eat something, your body is democratically fed, right? You your whole intestine system will actually make sure that every cell of the body gets the proper uh, food unless there's an illness in the body, right? Second thing is, don't forget all cells in your body are sisters and brothers. In fact, they're clones. In fact, they are the same individual, just with differently expressed genes, more or less. I'm not talking about bacteria that live in your body, but, but your cells are essentially all the same. So in other words, they inherently have to work together. They are inherently, the, the selfishness is holographic. It's spread over the whole body. And so it is basically a bug when that doesn't work together properly. So does yeah. nationalism create a kind of like, um, not a virtualization, but but this idea of um, being more like clones and changing the logic of cooperation. Yeah. Yes, yes, Great. you're right. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Basically, the brothers in arms or brothers in uniform, that's why it's also called uniform. Everybody has the same uniform. They are all like you. You forget the differences in this moment. That's exactly the point. Yeah, I mean, I... I basically it was implicit to the argument, but I now realize that, yeah, you're completely right. Mm -hmm. And this is both the advantage and the danger of it, right? The advantage is that you get many people working together on a common goal, that this advantage of it, that you can actually send many people into, um, into their death um, for mistaken judgment, for slip of the tongue for whatever reason. I'm, I'm talking here with obvious um, side side views to, you know, Germany, the war uh, against France in uh, 1870, uh, which was started by um, essentially a diplomatic provocation by Bismarck, or the First World War, which almost started, well, it's hard to say whether it was intentional or just a slip or just had to happen it's a complicated story i'm not a historian at all i'm interested again more in the system but yes you can send all these people into their join the aligned death 
the um i don't know if this analogy works but so to bind people together as a nation um like to have some sort of like a, a common i guess hope and faith or like across them a common narrative and a mythos like it's And in terms of like uh, kinds of selfing, um, it's, at least for me, it's kind of interesting. Like, so sometimes like I'll go through periods where I'm more, I think like driven in like a person way in which there's like a story, that's my story. And it means a lot to me and I'm living into it and that's what's motivating me. But a lot of times it's just about principle and it's just about like, uh, like, like things I hold that will, I'll hold uh, and, and they're not particular to me. Like, there's a sense in which they're more real than I am. And it's like, and it's, and they're, they're more me than I am. They're more me than the story. Like, like, like the story is all sorts of like incidentals and well, there's that part and there's this part, but like this, like common, like, like these core attractors, these, these seeds, the roots, but, anyways, but the, with that, so I guess now I'm thinking, wondering about like kinds of nationalism and what does it take for different, to, to create a national character that could um, s serve the functions that you would want and, and what are the failure modes? Well, the failure mo modes, uh, we have more than enough. I mean, um, just read every critic of uh, nationalistic um, behavior and that we don't even have to talk about the world wars. Um, there are lots of critiques about nationalism. Um, so we know the failure modes quite well. Um, what I feel is, what is being underestimated is that it had its role so it was not just oh it just happened it was a bad thing and and uh, we made a mistake we shouldn't have done that it's much more interesting than that because it had a reason why it emerged there was a not just a use case there was a very distinct need for this people felt they needed something to rally around you could say a flag, but the flag is just, again, it's just the symbol for what they rallied around. And this need was real. It was not just like uh, some people were talked to, you have to believe and so on. They felt they needed this. Now, the interesting part about that is um, what actually causes these things to fail? And here's, here's, I think, the lesson to be learned. The problem is not nationalism per se. Um, it is perfectly legitimate for, and I come back to your other questions. I have not forgotten it. Um, the, the problem, in my opinion, is not nationalism per se. The problem is that at some point it becomes a value in itself, and then it starts losing contact to the ground. Then the balance between the legitimate interest of the individuals or subgroups, or perhaps groups that do not fully belong to the to the nationalist entity, and the overall interest, they don't align that that well anymore. Now you have to re renegotiate that, but they are not renegotiate. The power is now devolved to one level or to the other level, um, and now this this negotiation has broken down, and so you get either hypernational states where the individual is not, not worth anything. The individual is nothing, is nobody. And these states don't have to be fascists. They can be also, uh, we have seen that also in socialist states. So the, both, both are actually de-individualizing the nation. The individual has nothing, has no importance. Or there is the opposite, where the individual is everything. Um, then then we can get things like i mean one example one extreme example are failed states where then the individual says well the, the state i don't care about the state i want to be powerful and then you get these local warlords that basically create um pyramid of loyalty via clan system by a family for example or by uh um by a loyalty loyalty dependencies and things like that um interestingly um one of the most famous examples of that is one of the largest countries ever, and that was the Mongolian Empire. That actually worked like a warlord empire initially. 
Later, they adopted Chinese uh, Chinese bureaucracy and administration. But at the beginning, it worked essentially like a, um, the, a warlords of failed states, except that there was just one warlord that controlled everything else. Loyalty was everything. The, the stories about, about the recursive loyalty of the, uh, uh, Genghis Khan's uh, state are legendary, right? He would actually punish people who would um, I think one story goes that um, some some subordinates of one of his subordinates found that that subordinate wanted to murder him, and they went to Genghis Khan and told him that, and he basically um, he executed them for breaking the loyalty recursion. So it was so important that loyalty would be pre preserved to the next level layer level up that he would even punish somebody who would actually whistleblow. Um, and that is, but in principle, this is a kind of the type of ruler that you have in failed states and very rarely, almost never, it happens that they actually get in power. And when that happens, then you get actually a proto-state or a proto-kleptocracy and that ceases to be a failed state. And that moment becomes a state, maybe flawed with all kinds of problems, but it is a state. But if you have uh, places where you have all these warlords that consolidate war, there is no central power. There's no central agreement what's right. The rules are made by whoever happens to be in charge on that spot. So to push some analogies till they break again, um, I wonder like even like a uh, within the attempted, hopefully not failed state of my own soul, um, I do feel like there's a, uh, a tension between um, principle and personhood. And there's different failure modes when I go too far in any given direction. So like, I it does become like, with personhood, it's like like sometimes like the loyalties, those particular relationships. That's like that's the sweetness and the meaning of my life. It's all those particulars. But but also though, there's like the long term plans, and then having to make sacrifices. And you know, uh, as much as I'd like to, I just can't hang out with my friends all the time. Um, and then, but then when principle goes too far, um, it becomes uh, it crowds out the person. And it crowds out like any given moment, like all these little sub policies I could pursue and enjoy and savor it. They become just like taken up into this like vision that has like the, that can become a tyrant, like unchecked principle uh, can be a fearsome thing. I, I found at least. Um, I agree. I mean, the, the problem with principles is also um, do they always work or do they stop working at some point? Right. So. I, I, I'm a fan of what I would call self-calibration. So, and that is something that can be done on personal level or on global level. Self-calibration is this regular checking whether whatever you do and the principles you follow and the rules you follow or the non-rules you follow are still appropriate to the situation. Um, do you need to fix something? Do you need to adjust something? Do you need to... Uh, modify the parameters a bit and this is a kind of self self um, yeah self calibration is the word that I like to use because it's actually like that maybe that's what meditation does I'm not an expert in meditation but but I do think that what you want is here to check okay does this principle still apply um, now in states you want principles to be upheld um, to a large degree and the reason is very simple because if you say let's say you have a group of people and they're all very sensible and this group of people keeps a certain principle and they just do it because they think it's right and they support it and then somebody breaks a principle for good reason nobody gets upset right everybody understands it's good reason and they make their own judgment that there was, was a good reason and and they know that this person will not break it again and now I'm going to contaminate this group with somebody who is either a troll or undisciplined or as you say, in low conscientiousness or whatever, somebody who um, does not work like that. When you start doing this, what happens is that person is going to exploit that. It's going to troll the system. Um, and then you end up in a situation where if this trolling of the system gives a payout, that accumulates, not a one-off, but kind of really starts 
starts becoming more and more, then others look, wait, why, why does a person get all these free passes for, for this principle that they're breaking? And now you have to, to make a decision. Do I give this principle up or do I enforce it? And now it's not any more common sense. Now it has become a principle that is being enforced by sanctions. Um, and now the question is, do you really want it? Classic examples, of course, um, the uh, Greek law give givers. Dracon, Dracon of, of Athens was, I think, probably the, one of the first lawgivers. Don't forget the word draconian. Draconian, exactly. He said, well, you do this, um, death, you do this, death, you do this, death, right? It was very simple, simple to remember. The problem is when you give death for every, every nonsense, um, then people, first of all, don't like it. And second, um, you enter in situations where it, it becomes counterproductive. I mean, and, in my right? own my own experience with um, being overly draconian, it it will even become a kind of like conditioning where it actually becomes hard. You you start avoiding the principle, or you start realizing it in kind of like uh, slightly avoided ways. Like like it ends up being it's not like um, an enthusiastic. Um, serving of the principle where you're like you're being creative and rich you're just like okay thank god i did it and it ends up being self-undermining like a draconian the, the draconian exactly. Yeah. exactly i mean i mean there there is the story it's it's probably not uh it doesn't apply to dracon but there's um um a legend and i have to say it's a legend it's probably it's probably not him that he he was in a battle and there was a law that He's not supposed to enter the city or the palace where the weapons are. And he basically forgot that because he came back and he said, I need more troops or he was something urgent, forgot to take them off. And then um, he noticed that he broke the law and then he wanted to commit suicide and said, no, 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 don't do this. Don't do this. It's OK. It's OK. No, no, no. I have to do it now. Um, so it can be self-defeating. On the other hand, sometimes you have these sacrifices that actually reinforce the penalty, like in the case of Brutus in Rome. Not the Brutus that killed Caesar, but the Brutus that deposed the last king um, when his, um, his uh, sons wanted to reinstate the kingdom. Uh, the Republic had been founded. Um, he actually, um, he basically um, convicted them and they, they were sentenced to death. And he sentenced his own sons to death to said the principle is more important than my family. Now here, the situation is a little bit different because it's not that the law generally is over principle. The problem is that he basically said, well, conflict of interest does not overrule the law, which is slightly different matter because somebody else should have made the same decision, not just him. That decision was a sensible decision if somebody else had made it. So basically, if he does it, it should not make any difference. And people would overrule that because say, no, my, these are my sons, so I won't do that. Then you basically have the conflict of two levels, the personal level and the principal level. They conflict. That's one reason why you want to avoid that. You don't want to put people in this position. And you don't want to have decisions that are not um, that are contaminated by possible interference of multiple levels of interests that are, especially when they're contradictory. Hmm. So yeah. I feel I feel yeah. Sorry, yeah. In terms of my uh, my uh, failed state modes of um, over draconian um, attempted adherence to principle of an over draconian variety. Um, it's like the avoidance patterns and the kind of like almost like adversarial attacks on it that I'm doing. I end up then like um, sometimes like doubling down on the principle. And it's like, but then it's like, it's like, it's like an escalating tension of like, uh, <laughs> there's some part of me that's like a rascal trying to get away from my duty. And then duty's like, no. <laughs> and, but it, that's, it just exasperates the situation of like feeling of pressure. And then like, 
you know, it just doesn't work. That's not a that's not promoting a society. That's not like bringing up the best in the society of atoms. You know, that's. This is why fi finding the right balance is so difficult. I mean, there's a famous general, maybe it was Alexander the Great. Um, I think in the battle, perhaps Gaugamela, he had the archers shooting arrows and ordered them when the, the enemy was at a certain distance to run away. That was the order to run away at a certain trigger. That was a distance trigger. Now, the cool thing about that is the following. He understood they would run away anyway. So he gave them the order to run away. So basically they did not disobey. So they were actually following the order by doing the natural, uh, taking the natural action. What I really like about that is that sometimes you have to understand that if something happens on its own, it's better to work with it rather than pretend you can control it. There is something really interesting, though, in terms of like, it sounds like in this example, there's almost like a, a leveraging of though the the non-necessity of control in that circumstance to actually deepen influence and then yes. like, you actually like establish like a good a good relationship to conscience or, or obedience to authority because in the place where it's going to happen anyways then you're like okay now we're going to practice authority when you wanted to do it anyways and it became like the enthusiasm was effortless then the like the yes. uh-huh and so you've like yes. established like, uh, so that's how you bootstrap a good conscience. Uh, where, yeah, where... You, you want, I mean, capable leaders are, why do they, they get um, loyalty, right? Because, because uh, not necessarily because you're nice. Um, it, it's the opposite. It's, it's not nicety that um, impresses people. What impresses them is kind of that they, they, um, how I say, log in to your natural drives. What is natural to you, they know how to log into that. Now, of course, it can go wrong, right? You can have manipulative leaders that know exactly to do that. Um, so the difference between manipulative and, and capable leaders is not as big in terms of toolbox uh, as we would like to think of. It's uh, more the purposes uh, in which they are different, right? So the, the good leaders are people who are thinking about distributing the well-being of the entity, of the whole, of the individuals, whatever. I mean, all the levels. Um, the less nice ones are thinking of typically themselves and their own glory and so on. But people forget, of course, that even the most, you know, um, dominant dictator is going to die at some point. So I always think that somebody like George Washington who understood that the American project is bigger than himself. That is something really rare. Um, Themistocles was similar, right? He, he probably was also understood that, you know, Themistocles who basically um, ruled or, or guided Athens through the war with the Persians and, and basically was one of the, um, brains between the victory at Salamis, uh, the naval victory uh, of the Greeks against the Persians. Um, but these are relatively rare cases. Very few <clears throat> rulers have this almost depersonalized um, view of service for the country. That is relatively, relatively uh, rare to find. Uh, it does it does happen occasionally, but these are probably the most prominent examples I've seen, the most obvious ones. So I'm going to want to uh, uh, lure you into uh, a trap. A trap where uh, <laughs> where, you ex where you where you explore with me um, for non-human advanced intelligences. To what degree do these principles apply to how we might want to configure them for the sake of both their intelligence and their alignment, uh, both for the sake of 
their intelligence and for the sake of making sure that their uh, impacts on society are beneficial. So questions such as like, do we need agent architectures ultimately for advanced intelligence or as people um, like Benjo, for instance, and others are suggesting, maybe you could have like purely depersonal truth-seeking agents, or do you need to, that are disembodied and, and, and that you, these can be potentially though, arbitrarily intelligent in terms of their understanding, or might we need something more contingent? But then if we're talking about agents, what are ways we can make that sure we can help to ensure these are the kinds of agents we want, both of them being powerful, but alignable. And like, so these issues of like statecraft and the, the statecraft of the soul, you know, ultimately, you know, I'm, yeah, this cybernetics governance, uh, you know, I, I want to be a good, good governor to myself, we all do. But for these minds, like what principles of governance, both in terms of the way we configure them as governing systems, and I suppose um, the ecosystems of then us and the governments we try to uh, impose externally, what are the good governance solutions? And we've, we've started talking about this in terms of, you talking about like, like the multiple, not looking for, a, making sure you don't have a single point of failure, multiple check systems in a kind of um, dialectic where they're um, co-evolving and, and co-regulating. Um, but so I guess, yeah, so the questions uh, that I want to lure you into would be, uh, yeah, to what degree, what does this say for the way we might consider, um, design artificial intelligences, these principles of generalized statecraft, generalized governance? Uh, very good question. I really like it. Um, the question of governance is a complicated one. And the reason for that is that the what the scientist says and what the politician says and what the general public says they are not necessarily aligned. So let's let's analyze the problem. Uh, who are the players? So we have, and there are probably more, but but let's let's talk about the more more obvious ones. We have the individual. We have the society, which is not the same as the individual, as we know. We have the companies building these machines, and we have the governments that may or may not regulate these machines. Finally, we have the machine itself, which at some point might end up becoming a kind of agent or might have to be considered as a type of agent, something which has more difficult to decompose or more difficult to re reduce um, drives that that it does whether we can say well it's it's causal or not causal it's not so important but essentially the best way to look at it as as an agent is a bit like saying okay there's a bureaucracy and they, they made this decision we treat for example um say the tax man as an agent uh, we treat it as an agent although it's a complicated bureaucracy which probably has lots of deeper personalized decision making still we treat it as an something that wants things and such we have as such we have to consider possible ais like that now a lot of effort is actually taken right now in the censorship of for example ChatGPT. if you look if you ask the wrong question you get um answer like oh i'm just an ai and therefore i cannot have an opinion but blah 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 and then there's some kind of statements to that effect so you see that people have tried to actually take out this agency out of this chat gpt um so first of all we have identified what what the players are let's start with um with whom shall we start shall we start with the companies so the companies, of course, are in a conundrum now because it's a bit like taking a firecracker and throwing it over the over the fence and oh, hearing a boom. Instead of the boom, you hear uh, stuff breaking, uh, glass uh, splintering, and lots of people shouting. Clearly, a firecracker had more effect than you wanted it to have. Okay, so it's. Yes, you have empowerment, but not of the kind you wanted. Um, it creates attention, and suddenly the government start looking with a big eye. Or the, or as I like to say, the eye of Sauron is now upon the companies because you think, hmm, we have to regulate that. 
And when governments get regulating, nothing is safer from them. Um, now, in Western governments, I'm less, to be honest, I'm more concerned that it will be overregulated, right? So you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, and and then then it gets all bogged down in big mud. Um, as I said last time, this is probably the safer route. Um, but of course, governments can topple, and suddenly you get a government that finds it perfectly okay to use this thing to either spy on people or build better um, image recognition, pattern recognition. Now the new cameras in the, in the UK, I think that can look who's actually in the car driving the car uh, in addition to the, to the sign. And basically privacy becomes a story of the past. It's all the story of the past anyway. Your computer is actually essentially publicly, what you have in your computer in principle, people can come on it and watch it if uh, watch what you have if they have have an, enough of a, um, what you would say um, uh, incentive to do so but the problem is a little bit more than that now not just that it is the information available but there is now an entity that can actually summarize this information they can actually make a dossier about you they can decide that every person in this country gets a dossier made and now i say i ask this let's call uh, this the centralized big let's call it a uh, big brother system um let's ask give me the dossier about the ten thousand most interesting people in this country concerning political leanings. I'll, I'll take an example. It really doesn't matter what it is. And suddenly, people that otherwise never would have come to the radar because, you know, they just do the stuff under the radar. Suddenly, they are in... The eye of Sauron is on them. And that is, a, I think, my opinion, one very worrying potentiality. It's something that people are afraid of since Orwell at least. Um, and now it's possible. Now you don't need any more hordes of people to do that. You have just this one software. We accept it. Yeah, sure. Uh, granted on a big machine, but never mind. You can run it centrally and make a dossiers about all kinds of little black books about every single person in the country. Number two, even more worrying is something else that's actually not under control of the government. And it's not even under control of the companies. If you have a machine that people believe is intelligent, it's not important whether it's intelligent or not. It's enough that people believe it is. You see, um, in earlier times, people would hire by various criteria, various simple external criteria. Some companies hired via Zodiacs. Some companies hired via the big five. Some people, companies hired via Myers Briggs as determining factors. Now you have ChatGPT and I say, oh, should I hire this person? Now ChatGPT basically can, and I'm not talking about people that lose their job because of it. I'm talking about people that don't ever get hired because Big Brother decides, Big Brother computer system decides that, no, uh, they, they don't convince me. And it's not transparent. Nobody makes this decision. This is the only criterion you can't appeal to it. There's no way for you to actually defend against this thing. And there was not even a human that said, I don't like his face. You know, that you know, a human may not like your face and they will not invite you, right? But here there's a machine, and this is a universal machine, everybody uses it. So you end up not getting a job anywhere, not because of anything just because the machines are just there are three or four different systems that people use and they all basically agree that some parameters of this person don't look good. Yes, now, least, I would definitely be uh, dinged because, you know, like I uh, will sometimes uh, adopt more like Philip K. Dick, like sensibilities or talk in metaphors. Like they would think <laughs> it would not go well, I think, if they just like, if they just kind of like searched across all the things I've written and said, like, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I keep track of the disanalogies, but I'm, I'm fine to like play with like very high temperature searches, knowing that I'm doing that. But then if that's not on the record and then you then match me, I might get dinged by that system based on a, a very reasonable statistical inference 
but because it wasn't actually someone to, it didn't have the oversight to like know what it meant uh exactly and this is why the by the way very similar i have an analogy from uh dnas i mean dna is a, a wonderful tool to establish whether a person's biological material was somewhere or not you can clearly say this person's biological material was here for a while people actually identified dna with a proof finding dna for person says this person has done that crime which you know it increases probability drastically of course and it puts a big pointer on that person but it's simply not enough to convict and that is something that only comes out that people can have leave the dna for completely innocent reasons. So in other words, DNA is one of many factors that should come into play, not just one factor. Um, but because people will say, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the promise, somebody is going to write a book where they say, and systems like, let's say, ChatGPT are integrating everything, and therefore they are more reliable than an individual human's judgment. I guarantee to you, somebody is going to write this sentence or a sentence that says something similar in a book where they think this is what we should do in future i i i, I smell it now what some, the problem in some with, ways they won't be wrong in some ways they will always be wrong and they make huge mistakes we know that the self-driving cars um are quite reliable surprisingly but they make mistakes on completely unexpected situations well, <laughs> until they're suddenly not until they're suddenly not and there's no warning right it's not like with humans where most humans can feel that something's off or the type of mistakes they make are you know they are mistakes you we can follow of tiredness or 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 inattention or something like that um or they have malicious intent that's also understand you can also follow it you can understand how where it comes from but these machines will fail in completely unexpected ways really big holes like complete failure of of of, of doing something this is the second worry i have number three of course is yeah um society society will now have a problem because people will lose their jobs a lot of people will lose their jobs. And the question is, will they get something else instead? It's not clear. Because if you are somebody who summarizes articles, or you're somebody who puts together paralegal document or things like that, I mean, it's only a matter of time until you can get these systems to be more accurate in terms of facts. It, it, you know, it will not happen tomorrow, but it will happen. It's clear that now the technology is so far that this is something that's very clear on the rise. Five years, 10 years, 15 years. I'm not going to make any guesses. Um, so what happens with these people? What do they do? These are jobs that are paid well because they are not easy jobs. They require intellectual capacity. And yeah, and they'll... You know, we talk like, oh, the, the AI will create more jobs than it takes. But the question is, will people be able to retrain? And will the people whose jobs are taken be able to retrain? So it's like, well, which people are we talking about? Yes, maybe more jobs theoretically are created. But what about the what people? Jobs? Yeah. What jobs? I mean, one has to be, exactly. you know. You, or whom? <laughs> if you say, exactly. First of all, this is a classic thing. You people cannot just be shunted from one job to the other easily. But let's even assume. So when you have cars, you move from, from horse, horseback to cars. Um, okay, then, then you know, you ride, you're, you're basically the coach, coachman, coach person, and then you become a driver. Good. Okay. I, you can see the analogy. Good for the coach, the job... not for the horse. Hmm? Not for the horses. It may be good for yeah. the coaches, but not for the horses. They, they weren't able to retrain in time. Yeah, I think the horses uh, wouldn't mind being left alone um, and um, and being basically on their own, right? I mean, the horses, they don't... I don't think they enjoyed the... Maybe the specious horse did, 
but I'm here, I'm, 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 I'm quoting Harari. He said, in terms of biological success, chickens are probably the most biologically successful vertebrate we have today. Um, of course, most of them are very, very miserable. <laughs> the aliens come down from space and they see like the chickens, they're the ones in charge. They're being taken care of all their needs. They're, they have huge stuff. No. Yeah, and then they go away and forget that to, to um, the forget to visit uh, Colonel Saunders, right? Uh, so, so, we, so we have a kind of panopticon, scary if it's working well or if it's not working well. We have yes. um, catastrophic failures that are unpredicted, where even like if it's working well, they could be even more costly because we trusted them more and we pushed harder into the failure. And then we have basically the um, the creative destruction might have a lot of destruction. <laughs> the, the creative destruction of the marketplace, the, the, they're sure, yeah, they're gonna, there's gonna be creativity, but what might not be created is a sufficient uh, safety net or contingency plan for the people who need it in time. That might not exactly. be, a lot of things will be created, but maybe not that. And without that, you may get huge unrest, social unrest and just and just people's lives ruined because unless they're somehow right. taken care of. Yeah. Exactly. So we, we are here um, and these are all the dangers that come all before the AI itself is a danger per, per se. So by, before the AI becomes an agent. Um, now, of course, people are worried, okay, the AI will become self-aware and so on. Well, yeah, you know, maybe that will come too. Uh, it's, it's, it's never, one should never say never, right? Um, sorry, James Bond. Um, it, it's true. Never say never. Um, but even before that is the case, we have these three lay layers of problems. And of course, if the AI should become um, get a self interest some, in some way, uh, it might be a problem. I must say, however, that we need to be careful not to project onto it our thinking. Because when humans have interests, that's because they are evolutionarily dry, driven to, uh, to do certain things, to have offspring, uh, to try not to die. And that, that determines what they decide to do in, situ in, the, in situations of pressure, for example. Um, but humans usually are not that averse to go to sleep. I mean, some people are, but, but most people are, don't mind going to sleep because they assume they will awake next morning. That's the assumption. Um, an AI that you say, oh, we turn on you off today, but tomorrow we turn you on again. The AI says, fine, no problem, because it's not worried about its future, right? So even if it has the self-awareness and self-consistent and self-preservation um, self, um, instinct, if it had that, doesn't mean that it, translates into a destructive wish of destroying humans. The actual danger is more that it will destroy humans because of stupidity, because of some stupid bug that decides, okay, now we have to do that. Because of course, right now it needs us. It will probably need us for the foreseeable future, at least 50 years. It needs the energy, it needs the, the, the uh, par, uh, you know, parts, uh, replacement parts, it needs, needs um, the, the, the infrastructure. For the AI, the humans are perfect, perfect, uh, say, wouldn't, wouldn't call slaves, uh, servants, or not even that, uh, basically logistics. The AI needs that logistic. That is not something it can do itself. Robotics doesn't work yet. So, that the real danger is that just, it's just stupid. And in fact, the fact that the AI is stupid is not the biggest danger. The biggest danger is that humans are stupid. So that some people will connect that AI to internet of things or nuclear weapons. You know, there are people who, who think, I mean, I would say nuclear weapons, probably not. Um, I think there are enough holes to prevent to make it fail safe uh, and experience from the cold war where i think we had three or four times where we could have blown each other to smithereens during the cold war and they have taught to tighten security measures so i don't think the ai will be given access to that but you know internet of things would be horrible 
were disastrous. You could basically turn off whole cities this way. Um, but finally, having the eye like that is a vulnerability of unbelievable level. If you get access to a failure mode of this AI, you essentially can make people do things, especially non-critical people, do things that you know manipulate them very slightly. So you don't manipulate them very strongly. You manipulate them only slightly. And we know that if you manipulate uh, people a little bit to use a bit more energy or do a little bit more of that or do a little bit like that, can destabilize com com communities, you can destabilize countries. Again, this is a conspiracy type scenario, which I'm not usually a friend of. But having something have a like- that I do see though, in my crazy, mm -hmm. when you have a target uh, that valuable, you, um, people might start to plan around it. This, the incentives would be so strong. It would bring conspiracies into being. Exactly. And we come back here to an old story that- uh, the, uh, the effort thank to conspire with that kind of potential payoff. Yes, it's a, it's a bow tie. It's a bow tie in the in the language of um, uh, in, in, we discussed it. I think in the, the bow tie um, uh, architecture some some time time ago in one of the, our previous talks, um, Doyle and in, in Doyle's language, um, the bow tie means there is this one universal channel where everything goes through, and therefore it's worthwhile to attack that channel. So this is exactly what you said right now, exactly what you said right now. And yes, we have that. So it's worthwhile attacking it. That being said, of course, people will then start protecting it, right? I don't think people are that stupid. People always say, oh, we could do this and that and that. Usually you find these failure modes, modes early on and they will be fixed. The real danger in my opinion, is typically human stupidity, not machine stupidity. It's the fact that humans then start to, um, let's put it this way. I'm not worried about short-term mistakes, usually. Yeah, except for a nuclear weapon, stuff like that. But I'm not too worried about mistakes that happen as blips in the temporal, the tem timeline. I'm really worried about things where society and fashion is deprogrammed. I can only call it deprogrammed in a way or pro programmed in a way to think in a certain way that is very, very, very difficult to take out from this, this group of people. That's what I'm really worried of. So you can, once you put an idea in the minds of people, for example, if I'm an um, employer and I believe that this thing is, uh, is, is a valuable asset for me to hire people, you will not get that out from, from this, this uh, generation of employers. It will take you 15 years, 20 years, basically a full generation of, of employees will have to live with a type of fashion. There are many examples like that. That is what I'm really worried about. You, you introduce a fashion and you don't get it out of the system. It could be just doesn't have to be employers. It could be, for example, um, legal legal standards. It's, it might be premature. And I, we definitely won't have time to get into this today. But I guess what I'm wondering is, like, if we could eventually make artificial agents, even though there's a risk there, could that provide? Um, well, even though it will have its own dangers. Um, could that also be a source of solutions in terms of avoiding, basically, don't build stupid systems, but try to build systems like highly intelligent aligned agent systems eventually. And that if, if, if we're not, uh, if we make it that far, um, that that, um, and so then I guess the, the questions I, I would wonder is what are the roles? Is it the case that, um, like the roles of agency and intelligence um, and different kinds of agency and what it might take to realize them. So, you know, so people are leaping right to super intelligence and they're taking over the world. 
um, the, the, these uh, systems that don't exist. And so some people are saying, don't build agent architectures because of this. Build some sort of like Oracle system that just uh, uh, seeks truth and evaluates hypothesis spaces, but has no desires. It never, never interacts with the world. It just, you, you feed it in the, the data and it, it figures it out with reference to some sort of knowledge base. But yeah, the, the problem is, I mean, you could ask, okay, what's the best organization of knowledge or, or cognition or information flows to get certain goals? And to some, in very small cases, you can actually compute that exactly. You can say this is the best organization of information. Um, the problem is really that it's not clear who are the agents in society. Right. Um, I mean, if you believe Lachmann's um, and his colleagues new framework that basically agents are vessels or essentially humans are, for example, vessels of various interests. Um, basically, for example, genetic interests, social interests, um, uh, the individuals, the ego interests and so on. Right. It's not just one interest. There are many things that are competing for the resources. Right. Um, you always feel that if you, you feel that you want to eat now or you need, need to um, or you need to um, uh, you need to uh, do your paper and want to do your paper and they're, they're competing interests here that they have to share a single resource. The problem that you have facing is how do you organize that and for that is there's no clear answer because the question is who's your who's your domineering time scale who's actually going to get reap the rewards of what you're doing now which of these sub agents in you is going to get the reward that's basically the question and that's not not it doesn't have a unique answer um i think that this, it was zimbardo who wrote this book i forgot the title where he talks about the different types of time um time characteristics of of the psychology of the psychology of of people basically some people are oriented to the past some to the present some to the future and some to the transcendent future that's that's uh, in a nutshell um so you could actually say who gets the reward who's supposed to get the reward of whatever i'm doing now? and that cannot be decided not even for a single person obviously it's not very clear how to do that so you have to make an educated guess um i think that one thing that we need to make sure is, and here I'm returning to the Venetian model, no one agent, no one level gets full control ever. The whole point is what, if you want to move to a new equilibrium, you have to negotiate it. You cannot just do that without having to negotiate your way there. Coercion, coercion, uh, power games, pushing through is something that by nature should be resisted. And that's why I said the regulation of government is not something that I like to hear, but it's probably not a bad thing if it happens. Um, because any move into a direction, a quick move into a direction is something that needs to be made more tedious especially now that things are established when you do science you try this you try that you know you try out stuff you don't want to be hampered by difficulties but the moment that you start exploiting that's the moment when you have to start thinking okay what are the balances and checks that i want in place to make sure that no single entity of a whole system can make decisions without taking into account the various forces that are in play. Whether it's a government, whether it's a company, whether it's an individual, whether it's society, that has to be in balance. And the balance, there may be different balances, there may be different equilibria, but it has to be negotiated. It cannot be just imposed on the system. That is, I think, the critical part. In the moment somebody wants to impose something, and by the way, humans are very, you already said it yourself, they're naturally opposed to something being imposed on them because exactly in my opinion of this reason they have this bubble of autonomy around them they expect it to be there 
And when that is violated, they resist. It doesn't have to be big, but they resist. Hmm? It's psychological reactance. I think that might be the yes. term. Yes. And that is very valuable. One has to give res respect to it. One doesn't have to agree to it. One doesn't have to end the negotiation saying, okay, we, we just leave you alone. But it has to be a negotiation if we want to do it. So in other words, what you want is a system that where this negotiation is a default and where it's not just basically um, we are steamrolled by decisions, whether they, it's from the government, whether it's from companies, whether it's from individuals, whether it's from society. The steamrollering must stop. I do think that is kind of the lesson learned. How do we stop it? It's a very good question. Can the AI itself do that? Well, probably if you pit multiple AIs against each other. And not against, not in an adversarial way, but in a way that says, well, you can't just do that. Yeah, you have to negotiate with others. There needs to be a balance of power. And that's what you want in situations like that. You want to make sure that is not, there's not a single entity that can take over. Um, that's very hard to do. It's very hard to do. Normally people are don't like that because it's very, I would say, coercive. It, it feels coercive. It feels like, um, um, you know, we want just to do that now. Um, well, yes, we just to do that now is good for exploration. It's not good for exploitation. Once you move to the exploitational stage, yes, you want it to be tempered with whatever else is out there that might have a right to have a say in whatever you want to exploit. Seems like a timely conversation. Maybe we'll go deeper next week or a different direction. Yeah. But, um, thank you, Daniel. Thank you.